Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Larry Patterson, and I work for the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Nashville. I'm honored today because my organization has asked me to uh, welcome you all to our very first meeting of the MTA strategic planning process. It's good to have with us Metro Council members Berkeley Allen, Peter Rustenholm, and also uh, MTA board chair Marion Ott and board member Freddie O'Connell. Um, this is the beginning of a year-long process, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we have a good transit system here in Nashville. Uh, last year, our bus system moved 10 million riders. Uh, we're doing a lot of things today that we weren't doing five years ago. But our city is changing at a much more rapid pace, and the transit system of tomorrow will need to be different from the system that we have today. It's exciting to see Nashville really come into its own, and it's in large part to our, uh, because of our city leaders, our uh, mayor, Mayor Dean, our Metro Council, and many other people in this room today. You have been creative, you have worked hard, and you have our city moving in the right direction. That is why we want to make sure we hear from you and from everyone else that has an interest in the future of transit in this city. What do you think our transit system should be? What are the values that we want to shape the system that we create? And what principles do we want to be guided by in this process? One of the reasons that we think this is the right approach is because we have seen it work with Nashville Next. For the past three years, the Metro Planning Department has been guiding our city through a long range planning process. They have done great work and they began their process with similar questions about values and guiding principles. And before we open it up for your feedback, I want to ask Tiffany Capehart from the Planning Department to share a few insights from their work with Nashville Next. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. This is an exciting process because MTA is starting their strategic plan. Nashville Next is wrapping up, so we're excited about that. Sorry, guys, to have to pass the torch on to create starting another process. But So I'm here to give you an update on Nashville Next, where we are, where we've been. And we're just thankful that MTA is working with us, and it's, and it's a great partnership. Um, and we're happy to be here to share what we've done. Okay, so let me just see a share of hands of folks that have been involved in Nashville Next in some way or another. Okay, great. So a lot of y'all have heard some of this information before, but you know, Nashville Next is a three-year process to update Nashville's general plan. And um, we are uh, just happy to be, you know, and excited to be wrapping up that process and working with MTA as they start their strategic process. And so with Nashville Next um, in planning, you know, we're responding to trends within the region. And so I wanted to go through very quickly some of the trends that we're responding to as we're thinking about Nashville over the next 25 years. And so we're looking at a growing community. Luckily, Nashville is gaining in population as well as uh, other places within the region. So by 2040, Nashville is expected to see about another 185,000 people in Nashville and about another 326,000 jobs. And similarly, counties like Williamson County um, and Rutherford County are growing fast, just as fast as Nashville. So we're growing in population. We're also becoming a more diverse community. If you look between these graphs between 1980, 2010, and 2040, you see that the share of population between uh, white, Caucasian, black, Hispanic, Latino will, be, will have a share of about a third of the population in 2040. So we're becoming a more diverse place, which just makes us a, a richer and better place as a, as a city. We also are looking at changing households. So the number of households with children over the next 25 years will be decreasing, 
while the number of uh, house households without children will be increasing. And why is this? Because we're, what we're seeing with the population, uh, we're seeing a shift where we're having a, a younger population and then our baby boomers kind of colliding at the same time. And our younger population are waiting longer to start families while our baby boomers Hopefully, if they're lucky, their children have moved out <laughs> and started their own households and their own families. And so with these two populations, um, they're looking for similar housing types, um, smaller households, and places that uh, are more walkable and closer to amenities. And so that's why we're seeing um, households without children um, increasing so rapidly over the next 25 years. Um, and as a part of that, over the next 25 years, our housing market um, is going to change as well. And so the, the types of buyers that we're going to see in our housing market, market are going to be a share between folks that are going to be starting out with their first home and a, a third of folks that are kind of peak home buyers and that other third of folks that are those people that are downsizing. And so over the next 25 years, all of these folks are going to converge on our housing market at the same time, looking for similar housing housing uh, types and products, um, which also, like I said before, includes kind of downsizing, you know, smaller lots, smaller homes, but that are really closer to amenities and services, including transit. And so this impacts our, our overall quality of life. So, you know, as a result of these trends, um, communities are thinking differently about how our communities grow, where and how they grow, and also how we get around our communities. Um, I'm excited about this process because I live in Antioch. And everybody knows what that means. <laughs> it means I-24 between the hours of 8 and 10 and 5 and 8 in the afternoon. So we're thinking differently about what quality of life means in terms of transit and how we get to and from work and how we get to and from um, amenities. And so over the last um, three years, Nashville Next has um, been engaged in community outreach to create the Nashville Next plan. And the things that I just mentioned have been um, similar sentiments throughout the process. Over the last uh, three years or so, we've had more than 250 meetings or have attended events um, in the Nashville community. And so that's why when you all, all of you raised your hands, at some point we've seen you over the last, over the last three years. Um, we We've had book a planner presentations where you've contacted us and we've come out to your neighborhood group or your civic group and given a presentation like this. We've done community events. We've done um, media through TV, social media, radio, reaching all different points and uh, populations in Nashville. And we've also made special effort to reach hard to reach populations. Um, and this includes our young people our seniors who often can't get to meetings at in the evening. So we've gone to 50 forward um, uh, locations throughout the day. We've also tried to reach um, uh, uh, our new American, new, uh, new American populations, and all of the outreach that we've done. The charge that we were given at the very beginning of our process was the success of this process will depend on how well we engage the public. And so our staff really took that to heart and did everything that we could to make sure that we engaged Nashville in this process. And so through phase five, which is where we are now in our process, we've reached out to over 17,000, or heard from 17,000 people or commenters in our process. And that number is going to continue to grow as we move into phase five and gather uh, feedback on the draft plan of Nashville Next. And so this was a, a wordle from early on in the process. And as you can see, transit was the number one issue that was identified early on in the process by Nashvillians. OK? Now, I hate to tell you that affordability edged out transit <laughs> um, a little later on. But as you can see, not by very much. And so that really speaks to not only, you know, uh, this is an issue, um, a top issue for Nashvillians, but we also have begun to link housing affordability and transportation in our conversations talking about the next 25 years. So those are two top issues that we've seen from the public. And this has been consistent throughout the three years that we've engaged Nashville and Nashville Next. 
So with that community input early on, um, Nashville Next began to identify guiding principles that would serve as the foundation for Nashville Next. And you see them here. So ensuring opportunity for all, expanding accessibility, creating um, economic prosperity, fostering strong neighborhoods, advancing education, um, championing the environment, and be Nashville, which really speaks to the spirit and culture of Nashville and who we are as Nashvilleans. And so the Nashville um, plan, as I said, we're entering into phase five, which is the final phase of creating the plan and actually going forward and presenting it to our planning commission for adoption. And these are the components of the plan that you'll see if you um, have taken a look at the website. The plan is posted and, and it, we're taking comments now. But there's a, a five volumes, and there's a volume on the vision, trends, and strategy. So it goes into greater detail about those trends that I mentioned earlier. Um, different elements in, in the plan, which goes through housing, arts and culture, and like that. Um, our community plans, um, very specific action steps in, in various areas. And then Access Nashville 2040, which is basically the transportation plan um, for, for Nashville. And so I'd really, if, uh, if you're here, you're a trans transit advocate, and so I really encourage you to um, take a look at that, that uh, component of the plan. And so the, it should be noted that the primary function of Nashville Next is to guide land use decisions, so zone changes, subdivisions, um, public investments. But also, there are also areas um, that we ought to address that add to quality of life in Nashville, but that also have some land use implications. And you can see those here. So like I said, arts and culture, education and youth, economic and workforce development, natural resources and hazard adaptation, housing, health and livability in the built environment. And then land use transportation infrastructure really ties all of these elements together to talk about how our land uses should align with our transit system and then also the infrastructure that supports our neighborhoods and our, our communities. And so the growth and preservation map this is, um, so let's talk about land use. The growth and preservation map is the land use vision for Nashville, and it, it outlines the community's expressed areas of growth and preservation. So this map was created after several, um, after about two years of community input, doing growth mapping exercises with the public to find out where would you like to see growth occur. And I'll just kind of go through some of the features of this of this map. And so the public told us that they wanted us to protect our sensitive environmental features. And so that includes a green network around the swath of Nashville that um, includes our steep slopes and some of our more environmentally sensitive areas, but also our parks and open spaces throughout the county. Um, a complete transit network. So not just thinking about our hub and spoke system that we've operated on for the majority of the years, but then also thinking about crosstown routes to, for folks to get to places without having to go through downtown. Um, affordability across all income levels, and we want to, the public said, we really want to see that flow throughout all of our neighborhoods in Nashville. Um, activity centers um, through most parts of the county. So thinking about not just um, having downtown as a 24-hour place or a place with intense activity, but allowing Antioch or Hickory Hollow Mall area and Rivergate and those types of places to really be these centers of activity for those communities. Strategic infill that supports transit lines and activity centers. So as we know, our neighborhoods will continue to change, but we want them to change very strategically um, and so that we preserve character. And so the best way to do that is to think about intensity along our corridors and infill along corridors, and then also infill around those centers so we have housing that supports the activities within them. And then protecting and enhancing different parts of the county, um, the character. And so over the years, the planning process has really um, discussed with the community about preserving suburban, urban, rural character. And then so the Nashville Next Plan continues to do that. And we do that through our community planning process. So while the growth and mapping, um, the growth and preservation vision sets a broad vision for Nashville, our 14 community plans go into greater detail for, for all of our 14 communities that have their own um, character and conditions that need to be addressed. However, the policies do implement that, that growth um, and preservation concept. 
Okay, so let's dive into the vision for transit, which is why we're here today, so MTA can kind of kick off that process of talking about transit. So the transit vision that's in Nashville Next and the Nashville Next plan is just that. It's a vision. It's a vision for what we want our transit system to be. Um, and this is the vision that MTA will start the conversation with you for its strategic planning process. And so um, what this transit vision is showing is, again, um, looking at high capacity transit corridors leading into and out of downtown, but then also looking at how we can connect these centers across the county with these other routes. Now this vision is not gonna occur within five or maybe even 10 years. This might be a 50 or 75 year vision, but you have to plan first for what you wanna see and then really have a conversation about how to get there. And so, Let's talk about how we get there. And then MTA will talk with you guys about the goals um, and principles, and then also other trade-offs that will have to occur. And one of those trade-offs will be land use. Um, in order for us to have a very robust um, transit system, we really have to begin to align our transit with our land uses, okay? And so what this graphic is showing you is that the more intensity that you uh, place within our corridors or our centers, that's the more people that you have coming and going from a place. And the more people that you have that will come and go and that can take advantage of a transit system. And so over time, we need to begin to build our land uses so that our transit vision can begin to align with that. And so wrapping up um, with Nashville Next, you know, we've done an awesome process um, partnering with MTA and other metro agencies and with you, the community. Um, but at the end of the day, what we heard was very consistent from what we've heard over the last, you know, 20 years or so in our planning process. And right now, the community is at a place where we, they, they're telling us we want to see implementation. We want to see a lot of these ideas happen. And so the way that we'll make that happen is by utilizing Nashville Next working with other metro departments, with Metro Council and the Mayor's Office, working with the community to really use our growth and preservation map, our community character policies and our community plans, and then that very detailed action plan to implement Nashville Next. And so there'll be annual, annual review of Nashville Next, and we hope that you as a community will buy into this vision that we've been able to set and then really begin to work on implementation. So Nashville next, um, just to give you some next steps, uh, we are now in the process, we have a draft plan that is posted on our website and we'll be doing review of the draft plan um, through the end of April. And so our first uh, large meeting that we'll host is gonna be on Saturday, April the 18th at the TSU downtown campus. MTA will be present there, and so if there's someone who um, you really think ought to be at these meetings who didn't get to make it, um, please have them come to the Saturday, April 18th event. They can look at the draft Nashville Next plan and then also speak with MTA representatives about their strategic planning process. And we'll continue to do coordinated meetings like that throughout the rest of the process. But here are some other dates that you can um, take a look at. And then there are also some brochures that are outside at the the um, sign-in table if you hadn't gotten that, and it has the dates also in included there. And then um, in June, we hope to take our draft plan to the Metro Planning Commission for adoption. And so we do um, encourage you to mark that date on your calendar. The uh, exact date is June 10th, and it's on the brochure, and we hope that you do come out and speak in support, not in opposition. No, can't tell you not to do that. But we do want you to come and express your opinions about Nashville Next if you've been involved. Um, we really appreciate it. So I want to say thank you to MTA for having us today and allowing us to give you guys an update. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this kickoff. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany. Now, at the onset of the program, we posed two questions to you. The first question is, how long is your commute? And so let's see the results. All right, so we see 10 minutes, 17 minutes, 45 minutes uh, per personal vehicle. I think we can top that in transit. Um, eight minutes, 30 minutes, and how often do you ride public transit? Now, if there's anyone in here who has never rode public transit before, 
you have never rode public transit. Not in, Nashville. Not in Nashville. Well, I would like to invite you all to be our personal guests on a route of your choice. I will personally ride with you. And it's free. All right? Now, uh, the consensus says that um, two to three times a month, one to two times a week, uh, once a week at a minimum, we would like to try to get that number up if possible. Uh, but as Tiffany mentioned, we're in the beginning process of our strategic planning phase. And uh, one of the things that we have to begin to do is we have to wrap our minds uh, around what are our values as a community and what are the values that we would like to see in our transit system. And so, and we want your help with that. And so I often ask myself the question, uh, what is the most important value to me? And the answer that comes over in my mind time after time again is safety. Now, I have a three-month-old daughter. Uh, she keeps me up at night. Uh, but in terms of long-term planning, I want a transit system that is safe for her. All right? And as Tiffany mentioned, it may not happen in five years. It may not happen in 10 years, but eventually it's going to happen. All right, so we're in the start of this phase and we would like your input. So what are some other values that you would like to see in transit? Convenient. I'm sorry? Convenient. Convenient. An annual bus pass. An annual bus pass. Efficiency. Efficiency. Reliability. Reliability. Later hours. Later hours. Yeah. Value for taxpayers' money. Value for taxpayers' money. Well, did you not hear at the onset of my introduction that uh, we're doing a lot of great things in transit? We're th doing things today that we haven't done in, in, uh, in the past five years. Um, our bus system, again, um, we moved 10 million riders last year, and we're excited about those numbers as we start to implement some of these things that we're discussing here today. Now, yes. My question was, what are some values that you would like to see in the transit and the transit company. Okay, different religious stop signs. Arabic stop signs. Arabic stop signs. Now, um, at the onset of the program, did everyone receive post-it notes and a pen? If you didn't get post-it notes and a pen, hold up your hand. We want to make sure we get those to you. You didn't get a pen. Can we get a pen? Now, I want you to begin to write down these values, and you would notice that in the back we have triangle kiosks set up, all right? And so what I'm going to ask you to do with your post-it notes is write down the value that you think is the most important. And so we heard convenient, we heard dependable, we heard reliable. What are those values? All right, write down the most important value, and then I'm gonna invite you to get up and place your post-it note on the triangle kiosk labeled number one. That is the most important value. And then I'm gonna ask you to take a second post-it note and write down the second most important value. And so I gave you one value, for me it is safety. So you know my safety is gonna go on the triangle kiosk number one. All right, and then I'm gonna ask you one more time to write down the third most important value and then get up and post it on the triangle labor number three. And I have one more instruction for you before we get up into the activity. I'm gonna ask that you put your uh, zip code on your post-it note with your values because we wanna get a consensus of if these, uh, these values are geographically based. All right? Any questions? All right, now let's go to the triangle kiosk and we'll get started.
Thank you for completing the exercise. I'm actually loving the way those boards look back there. And you guys came up with a lot of values. Now, thank you for your input. It just doesn't stop here. We're gonna have another meeting tonight, and we're gonna ask the same question of the people who attend that meeting. And then we're gonna get as much as in input as possible. Now, I wanna introduce you all to the guy that's gonna help us bring this vision to term. Uh, his name is Jeff Slater, and he is from the... <laughs> All right, his name is Jeff Slater, and he's from the firm Nelson Nygaard, and he's going to talk more about the specific process that we're going to take. Okay. Thanks, Larry. I'm also the light guy, so give me one second. <laughs> All right, so, so you heard Tiffany talk a lot about what the city has been doing in Nashville Next and, and some of the changes that are that are happening in Nashville and then how growth will become more focused. Um, and so those changes, the demographic changes that are happening in Nashville are really gonna create a, a much greater demand for transit than there is today. And then the changes that, that will be coming as part of next, Nashville Next will really allow the MTA in the region to provide much more effective transit. It will put into, into place really development patterns and have people living and working closer together in a way that really enables much better transit. So, so what I'll do now is um, I'll talk a little bit about our project and give you an idea of how we're going to do it um, and some of the potential improvements that we'll be looking at. And I want to stress at this point, potential. Um, and the other thing is a lot of what we're talking about today is focusing on Nashville and Davidson County, um, kind of because that's where we are this, this morning. But there's also a complementary effort undergo underway to look at RTA services. So also think about what I'm talking about today in terms of regional services and regional connections and not just the city of Nashville. So to start, and, and this repeats a little bit of what Tiffany said, so I'll, I'll skip over it, but really what, you know, why are we doing this? It's like um, Nashville is really changing, and Tiffany talked a lot about that. Um, and Nashville has grown from a small city to a medium-sized city and is, and is rapidly growing to a large city. And the transit services here really haven't kept pace and have fallen behind. And so a lot of this is to really to make up for lost ground and develop a, a great transit system for, for Nashville. Um, there are, uh, this isn't the only thing that's been going on. You just heard about Nashville Next. There's a Nashville Vital Signs report, report that pointed out that um, congestion and the inability to move around or the increasing dis difficulty of moving around is really um, hindering the ability of the region to, to, um, to really move forward and compete. Um, Nashville Next again, the AMP controversy, that was very controversial, but it also showed that people here really do want better transit. Um, the, there's a lot of questions remain on, on what, what is better transit, what do all of you want, and that's what this project is all about. Um, some of the challenges that we're facing is right now Nashville, the, the operating environment here is, is very difficult. Um, as, as Tiffany showed in one of her slides, that really the more density there is, the much easier it is to provide very effective transit. Transit that's, that's fast, convenient, frequent, that people want to ride. And when you have a couple of people living on a street in a rural area, you really can't do that. So, so at this point, um, Nashville is, depending on the measures or the reports you look at, the, the most sprawling or the second most sprawling metropolitan area in the country. Nashville next, those changes are going to start changing that again in ways that will will allow us to provide faster, more frequent, higher quality transit that, that will be cost effective and a good use of the taxpayer's money. Um, there are some strengths. I think there are the, the core system of routes here that serves downtown Nashville um, is a strength we can build upon. Um, the MTA has started to develop higher quality services, BRT Lite are examples of that. Um, you've also seen Music City Central, Music City Circuit. Um, as, the, as the MTA has had the resources, it's provided more frequent service. So there are some strengths to build on and that's, and that's an important part of this project. Um, there are a lot of weaknesses and we're also going to be focusing very much on how to address those weaknesses. Um, some of the, the mo most important ones, and I saw that many of you put sticky notes up to reflect these things, is that much of the service is pretty infrequent. Um, it operates for limited hours. Um, a lot of the system shuts down earlier than in other major cities. 
Much of the service is slow. BRT Lite is a way to address that, um, but much of it is slow. And nearly all service right now operates to and from downtown, so if you want to go somewhere else, it's difficult. Um, as part of what we've done so far, we've done, we've done work to really assess the effectiveness of the existing system. We've looked at what the underlying demand is here for transit. Um, for the peer review, we, we compared Nashville to 14 cities that we considered to be current peers. Um, and those are cities that are very much like Nashville is today. You can, you can argue about how much they're like them, but, um, and, and you'll all have some differences with some cities on those lists, but they do serve, they do um, share a lot of characteristics with Nashville. Um, but probably more importantly is we looked at um, other cities that were aspirational peers. And these, these cities um, were picked because they matched what was in the Nashville Vital Signs Report. So um, you might argue about Atlanta and it's a bit of an outlier, but th these are cities that are already like, um, in many ways, what Nashville is, is heading towards. So we looked at how transit works in, in cities that are like Nashville now and what Nashville is becoming. Um, in terms of, I don't have a slide on, what, on how Nashville compares to its current peers, but it's, it's in the middle of the range, so it does okay. You know, not, not particularly great, but certainly not poorly. Um, but when we look ahead to um, how transit works in, in the aspirational peer cities, you can see these bars show high and low, um, high to the right, low to the left in terms of how other cities rank. Again, Atlanta is an outlier, so we've also got in uh, these figures here the second highest, which are probably more relevant. But you can see in terms of how much money um, the MTA spends per capita compared to other cities, it's, it's near the bottom. It's not quite the bottom, but near the bottom. Service per capita, it provides a lot less service per capita in terms of the number of hours of service. And it provides, um, and its total ridership is a lot lower. So when we look at what the aspirational peers are doing compared to Nashville, we can see that there's a way to go. Um, so then looking ahead into potential improvements. And, and again, I wanna stress potential. Um, but we'll be looking at pretty much anything that's, that's reasonable. So, you know, looking ahead, um, I'm pretty confident we won't have hovercraft from each in East Nashville to downtown. Um, we're probably, pr pretty certainly, we're not going to have maglev. But, um, but one thing I want to stress is anything that's reasonable, we will be looking at. Um, starting out with a frequent service network or a high capacity transit network. Um, and that would be a network that provided um, very frequent service from early morning till late night or early morning, early morning um, that serves most of the major places people want to go. And, and if you think of many of you I know have moved here from Nashville from other places and you think of bigger cities like um, Boston or New York or Chicago, they have subway systems that provide that frequent service network, but cities that um, only have a little bit of rail or even don't have any rail can build those same types of network with BRT and bus services. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at here. Um, a lot of all these slides will also have questions on them. These are things we would like you to think about. I won't go all through all of those questions and we're certainly not going to ask each of you to answer each one here. Um, but, but these are things that we would like you to think about. And so how should Nashville really develop a high, high capacity transit network that would make it a lot easier for people to get where they want to go um, very, very easily? Um, secondly, what types of services should that system consist of? Um, again, we're gonna, we'll, anything reasonable is on the table. Some of the options are light rail streetcar, full BRT, BRT light, um, other things. So what should those be and where should they operate? Um, transit emphasis corridors. A lot of places have, um, there are places where a lot of routes come together and operate along the, the same alignment. Um, that's the case in downtown Nashville. Um, going out to, the, out to Midtown, there may not be one single route that's operating frequently, but you put all that service together and there's a lot of really frequent service and you can do things to give um, service transit priority and then service between the areas that it's served are it's really convenient. So the pictures here show the top is, um, is in Portland, what they call their transit mall, but actually does allow cars on it too. There are two lanes for transit and one lane for, for cars. 
and the bottom one is Market Street in San Francisco. And these are all streets that still have, have auto traffic on them, but there's a, a real high priority placed on transit. Um, I think this is a real biggie for Nashville, is um, more frequent service for longer hours, the work we've done so far. Um, you know, I think most of you who ride MTA know a lot of the services aren't that frequent. A lot of it shuts down earlier at night than in other major cities. And um, a lot of things that, one of the most important things that makes transit convenient is to have it be frequent and operate for the hours you need it to. So um, a lot of cities will publicize a system around a frequent transit network. The, the graphic on the right shows Seattle. Um, but many cities do that, including much smaller cities, Columbus, Ohio, which I believe is smaller than Nashville, is just adopting a system like that. Um, service to more places. Uh, the the, the um, graphic on the right comes out of Nashville next. Um, that's the conceptual plan, but as I talked about earlier, most of the service now comes in and out of downtown Nashville. If you want to go anywhere else and need to make a connection, you've got to come downtown and then go back out again. Um, so there will be a lot of options we'll be looking at in terms of just service to new areas, places that aren't served now that will be emerging, um, as well as cross-town routes, new regional routes, new express routes. Um, faster service also. One of the things that um, we hear about a lot is service is too slow, and I also saw sticky notes about that. So there are a number of ways to make service faster. Um, it can be made faster by doing some very basic things like making the route more direct and not having it weave around through so many neighborhoods. Also consolidating stops. Do you really need a stop every block? Um, there are also bigger things that can be done, um, such as transit priority. If I did this right, it's on the next slide. Yeah. Um, and so there are bigger things that can be done with transit priority, using exclusive bus lanes, peak period only bus lanes, queue jump lanes that allow buses just to, to bypass congested areas, transit signal priority for regional services. And um, many states are now using freeways, for allowing freeway bu or <laughs> express buses to use freeway shoulders. So when the, when the highway gets backed up, the express buses can go on the shoulders, and, and that provides a travel time advantage over cars. Another thing is simpler service. Um, a lot of what the, the MTA tries to serve a lot of places with um, some pretty significant limitations on resources. And so a lot of these routes just kind of wind around and probably try to do too much. And it makes it very difficult for people to use. Um, one idea is to have simpler service. You know, it's uh, ideally you'd like to have everything just go straight back and forth. That's not always practical, but um, there are a couple of maps there on the right, Route 22 and 38X. And you can see those alignments, and they're, um, they're pretty complicated, tough to understand. And, and does that really encourage more ridership or discourage ridership? Um, and then it's not just service. It's um, more comfortable facilities with better amenities. Um, I was waiting for a bus this morning at a stop that just had a bus stop sign. It was kind of tilted also. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so um, you can't provide something like the stop on the, at the top right um, at every stop, but we can provide better facilities and how important are those. And, and, and you definitely can include something um, like that one in Ventura, California in the bottom, but it's a personal favorite of mine, so I included it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So. Um, and, then I, and then I guess my current personal favorite is real-time information. Um, and that, um, so, so obviously a lot of you know what this is, and it will let you use, <laughs> at that bus stop I was at today where the sign was tilted 30 degrees, the, um, the bus was either late or didn't come, and after 10 minutes I took a taxi because I had to get here. So um, it would have been nice. I mean, the bus was probably right around the corner, and I gave up, and I didn't know, but I didn't know if I'd missed it. I didn't know if it was coming. So that's why I say it's a current personal favorite. But, but this is something that's very important, I think, to many people and clearly to a lot of you. Um, 
and so those are some of the bigger things, or I think some of the things that people have more interest in. There are also, you know, many other types of things that we will look at that go from improving public information, rebranding services. Um, there's an MTA and an RTA. Does it make sense to call them different things no matter how they're administered or run? Um, improving schedules, coordinating routes, developing outlying transit centers so that you don't have to come downtown to transfer park and ride. Uh, even pedestrian improvements on major arterials. One of the barriers is that to transit use here is that you know once you get off the bus, how do you get across the street? And some of these street crossings are very uncomfortable. So being able to have people get to the bus is also important. So, so as I said, anything that's reasonable, we plan to look at as part of this project. And and so we we start off by asking you questions about you know your values in, in pretty abstract terms. And so so these are some some more concrete things that we'll be doing. And we'd also like to know um, about what you think of those. I think I, I probably just um, covered that. So it's really um, you know the really. And I'll stress again, all reasonable options are on the table. We really want to hear from you. This turnout today is great. Um, and we'll be doing a lot more of these things. And my last slide, we'll talk about other things we'll be doing. Um, but what we're really trying to do is, is really transform this system and, and take it from a city that's, that's really not suited for what Nashville is going to become to make it a really great transit system for a great city. So just really quickly, you know, what we're doing. It's really, it's all in um, eight easy steps. Um, part of it's the stakeholder involvement, which you're part of here today. System and market assessment that's underway, nearing completion will be done in April. Developing a transit vision, um, and that's part of the reason we asked you for your values today. Develop a vision, figure out what that was, and, and develop this new system around that vision. Um, that, that will be done in June. Identify opportunities. We've, we've been working on that. I presented many of those to you here. They'll be done in September. Then, then throughout the rest of the project, develop system improvement scenarios. Um, we'll bring all of those scenarios. That's different ways we'll put those potential improvements together to build a better system. And we can focus on one thing more, more than another. Um, we'll put those together in scenarios, bring them back to you. We won't ask you to choose just one, but we'll ask you to, to tell us what things you like and what things you don't like. And then the recommendations will be um, mixing and matching those things to, to develop a plan that really achieves widespread support um, and will work well and will be a good, a good expenditure or good use of taxpayer money. So that's our, and, and this will run through, um, through really next spring. So it's about a year. Um, a little less than a year from now. Um, so finally, my last slide is um, on stakeholder involvement. You know, you're part of the beginning of that today. Um, there will be a number of other a number of other ways for you to get involved. There's a project website that just went live yesterday afternoon. Um, so go to that, which is in inmotion2015.com. On that website, there's um, a Mind Mixer. Um, it's a Mind Mixer, which is like an online town hall. And we will, we will ask questions about many of the things we asked about today. Um, you'll be able to st start your own topics and be able to start discuss among yourselves and let us know what you think about different issues as we go forward. Um, there is a project bus, the, the in motion bus that I think if you picked out, picked up the handout, if you look on the back of that, you can see a picture of that bus that's going to be going out to community events. Um, book a planner, you'll be able to have someone from the project team or MTA go out and talk to you and your groups about specific things that you would, about the project. Um, something that will probably be up in a month, a design your own transit system survey on the website where you can choose. You'll be given a certain amount of money and be able to choose the types of improvements you would like to, to use that money on. Um, and a bunch of a bunch of other stuff. So, um, so thanks again for coming, and um, we really want to hear what you think about these types of things. And then I think I, um, I hand it over to you, Steve. Yeah. Okay. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, Jeff. By way of introduction, I'm the closing speaker, and then we'll have some opportunity for interaction, both uh, formal and informal. I'm Steve Bland. I'm not allowed anymore. Uh, our chair, Marion Ott, tells me I'm not allowed to say I'm the new CEO uh, of the MTA anymore, but I've been here since about August, and I, I really appreciate the turnout that we had today. A lot of folks giving up your time, giving up your lunch hour. I wanted to uh, kind of highlight a couple things. First of all, there are comment cards, so if you do nothing else, please write out your ideas, your comments, your observations. 
what you'd like to see improved, what have you on a card, and leave it behind. Ideally, you'll leave us your, your email uh, contact, what have you. We are trying to build an extensive list so that as new information comes out or as additional meetings are scheduled, we can let as many people know as possible. I want to give you a couple of observations. Uh, I'm one of those folks, and there certainly are an increasing number of us who came to Nashville by choice, uh, came for the excellent opportunity that the MTA offered. But frankly, we came, my wife and I, because this is a place to be right now. Nashville is, for many folks, the center of the universe. And if you've lived here your entire life, you may not recognize how great a city this is and what a great city this is becoming. And one of the excellent opportunities we have, all of us in this room, is to really build a transit system that matches the excitement and the vibrancy of Nashville. And that's, I think, what a lot of us are about. Uh, very proud of what the MTA is, what the MTA does every day. But frankly, we can do better, we can do more. And with your help, we plan to do that. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on the AMP debate. You know, a lot of advocates of public transit were disappointed by the outcome of the AMP debate. You know, frankly, I look at it as a learning experience in Nashville's transit history. Every city that has successfully dealt with public transportation, with mobility challenges, had their own version of the AMP. And one of the things we learned out of that process is the earlier and the more public engagement we do, the better off we will be. So if there's nothing else that I want to communicate to you here today, we're very committed to doing aggressive public engagement to find out really what folks in all sectors of Nashville want out of their transit system. I'm also going to confess, even though we're getting some technical support from folks like the Nashville Next folks who've been doing it for a while, the MTA is new at this. You know, our history is, well, okay, we do a couple of the public meetings. You know, here's our plans. What do you think? And, uh, and we kind of take that as our public engagement. We know we need to do it in all sectors of the community and across all uh, boundaries of the community and in a variety of different ways. We would also appreciate, in addition to your input on what you want the transit system to look like, we really want your input on what that public engagement should look like. If there are particular groups we should be reaching out to, if there are particular events we should take the motion bus to, to have at the event for drop-in conversations, we would really appreciate that. Over the course of the six months that I've been here, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of groups and a lot of individuals, and this planning process has been a focal point for many of those conversations. And if there's a recurring theme that I've heard throughout the region, and by the way, not just Davidson County and Nashville, but the 10 county region covered by the RTA, the recurring theme is go big or go home. Um, and that means dare to be visionary in what you're doing you know, dare to look at something that's going to be working for the city, not just a year from now, not just five years from now, but building blocks that we can be working off of for the next 20, 25, or more years. And you heard some of that in the Nashville Next presentation. That also has to be accompanied by realistic improvements that we can do very quickly, and that, frankly, the community should be measuring us against. Anything from real-time information, I heard that. That's actually the biggest question. I've gotten since I've been in Nashville is, where's my app? Yeah. Um, the app is coming. I, I saw Dan in the back of the room. Dan is committing to me. By the end of the year, you will have real time. By the end of this calendar year. I have not said, I want to be specific which year we're talking about. Uh, one of the most cursed projects, but we think on a good track right now. Um, people are somewhat daunted by the size of transit mobility improvements. And if you look at the cities that have dealt with it, Denver, Charlotte, Dallas, you name it, um, they've spent, all of them have spent over $5 billion improving their networks. And in a couple of the comments and in looking at the boards, one of the key things I saw as a value is good value for taxpayer money. That has absolutely got to be a central focus of anything that we do. But I would argue when you're talking about how Nashville is growing, if you believe, as the trend predictors are telling us, a million more people will be coming to this region in the next 25 years, we really have to fundamentally come to grips with what we're going to do to move those folks around the region. And for those of us who might occasionally get stuck in traffic now or wait too long for a bus um, that isn't reliably on schedule, we know we have to do things differently. And the key to this planning process is to figure out how to do things differently in the right way for Nashville. 
Um, also, we have to look at it systematically. One of the things I say to folks is, you know, no one rides a transit project. So whether you're looking at something like light rail or bus rapid transit or, or a new highway, you know, nobody rides it because you might ride it the first time because it's new and I want to try it. You ride it because of the things that you're articulating in the back. It's convenient, it's reliable, it's faster, what have you. It's affordable, I can save money, I can get to the life activities. So anything we do from a project perspective has to be well grounded in the service model. You know, the, the best light rail system in the world, I would contend, from a structural standpoint, isn't going to work if it runs once an hour and it stops running at 6 o'clock at night. So we have to go from the basis of what the service model looks like and then strategically place those investments where we can get competitive advantage. If we need to achieve travel time savings, what's the best way to do that? The thing I would leave you with is one of the things I opened with. We are new to the public engagement process at MTA, and we have a lot of folks who are really talented with it helping us. But we would really appreciate you helping us even more. So I, I hope certainly in your comment cards you tell us what you want in your transit system, what the characteristics of service are you want. I also hope we get a whole lot of cards that say, you should go out and talk to this neighborhood group. You should go out and talk to this community association. You should go out and talk to this church congregation, folks that you know who are equally engaged in this, but frankly may not be able to take a good hour and a half in the middle of their day on Tuesday to come to the library and talk to us. You know, we're committed to getting out to where the people are, not frankly trying to drag them to where we are. So please help us with that as well. With that, I'm going to open it up to um, questions or comments or observations from the audience. Larry's going to hang here with us. Jeff's going to hang. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to know, when they uh, rewrite the number 10, right? Why didn't they take under consideration the elderly and the disabled that gets off at NES and they rewrite it to go down 18 where nobody's getting off the bus? You know, go up to Charlie, hit 18, nobody's getting off the bus there. The day I was on the bus, a person had to get off at the expressway to walk back to NES. Why didn't they continue to have one at least for the elderly and the disabled to still go in front of NES? Sure. Absolutely. And those are the types of things in any new service we like to take a look at. So I appreciate your comments, and uh, we'll certainly take a look at that for the next service well, change. I mean, no answer. Why? Uh, we'd be happy to have our service planning folks talk to you, talk to you inside. Yes, sir. We're out of Murfreesboro on 84X. Uh, we have several people that ride that bus that are only have. 96X comes in about 30 minutes uh, before the 80s for it does. We don't have enough seats to get everybody in the national all the time to go to work at 7 o'clock. If we could have the two coach buses, just the two buses that are already running, set ahead 10 minutes, that would give us 150 seats on the three buses to get people to the Great. We've had people left this week that didn't get on the bus because it was not skinny seats, and they got work on Something as simple as that. It doesn't cost any yep. more. It just sits in 10 Sim Simple and cheap is better than hard and expensive. So, and I know we've gotten the, um, you know, the um, email information from your trip, so we, we're factoring that into design as well. But thank you. Appreciate it, sir. Yes, ma'am. which doesn't help the uh, state workers who get off at 4.30. Okay, great. Uh, and again, the, these are all, uh, the, these are great, very specific suggestions we can act on. So I, I do hope you'll fill out the detail on a comment card and we'll be sifting through, we'll be sifting through the big picture ideas and what goes into a long range plan. But frankly, these are also great opportunities for us to figure out what we can fix in the next schedule change. I think we can safely commit to that, yes. Yes, we will make sure on the website that the slide presentations, um, sure, both the Nashville Next and the information that Mr. Slater went through uh, will make available on the, on the project website. Yes, sir. I haven't heard anything about tourists. Is there a thought with tourist-specific need and how that might be? 
Sure, actually, um, parallel to this, I know the Convention Visitors Corporation is sort of doing their strategic planning process, invited us into that, and we've in turn invited them into this. Uh, one of the theories, to be frank, I would convey is when you do the right things to make transit work right for the people who live here, it will work a lot better for the people who visit here. And, and Jeff hit on a few of them. Simplicity, convenience, things like real-time information, what have you. But without a doubt, that's a growing sector. And, and by the way, not just the, um, the tourists themselves, but frankly, the population of folks who live here who serve that, you know, service industry workers, what have you, who are going to a lot of those destinations. And a lot of it is, this is a city more than most that really isn't as much a nine to five city as it is, if it's not a 24 hour city, it's probably a 21 or 22 hour city. And that's a, an issue we get a lot is, uh, and frankly I experience as a rider is, it'd be nice if this ran a little later at night, yes, you know, those types of things. Yeah, I a lot of shows and concerts and CMA fest and all that, and then I have to leave early to catch right. the last bus. Not fun. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Oh, I saw a movie, right? And um, they had a picture of a religious cleric. Uh, they put the picture on the side of the bus, and then they had a religious flag out the window and drove off. And uh, I was wondering, like, do you have to, like, bring a bus, like, bring, like, a Greyhound bus to do that? I mean, can you do that on, the, on, the bus, on, this, new, on, the, on this new bus program that you provided with the driver? Or security say something about putting a picture of a man or a woman on the side of the bus like, before you drive off or the religious flag out the window? Uh, well, I mean, we have a general rider code of conduct we're happy to chat with you about, you know, after the fact. Yes, sir. Talk about service. So ideally, uh, you'll eventually have a more distributed system with more node the node uh, community center to job center kind of uh, options so everything's not wheel and spoke. But just as a, an interim, kind of a, a cheap fix while you're trying to get there, something I think that would improve the, the experience for a lot of riders and maybe increase ridership would be either free transfers or some type of reduced transfers. Sure. And I'm glad you actually raised that. A lot of the work that uh, Jeff and his group are doing and our service people are doing are service design and that type of thing. But observations you have on anything from fair structure, fair policy, um, passes, pass media, image stuff, uh, you know, Jeff raised the issue of the whole RTA, MTA, um, you know, what that, what that brand looks like. And actually that particular issue is one I've heard quite a bit as I get around the community is the transfer policy. So if you can describe to us, you know, okay, here's how I use it and here's why it doesn't work for me or here's how it could work better, you know, we would certainly appreciate hearing that, I, I come back to one of the cores of attracting and retaining transit ridership, simplicity. And simplicity isn't just where does the, the bus go or where does the train go, it's also, well, how do I pay for it? Um, you know, everything that's associated with, how do I know where it is, where do I stand, those types of things. So very much appreciate you bringing that up. It was something I was gonna make note of in my comments, but I'm glad I got it in Q&A. It's not just about where it runs, or is it a bus, is it a train? It's really every aspect of the rider experience. So I would appreciate you talking about that, or you know, raising that point. Yes, Richard. Steve, one, I think this could end up being a great process. Uh, and I like the comments about making the small improvements, but also you made the comment about a lot of people are saying, think big or go home. Well, everything comes with the price tag. Right. Is part of this process going to be a recommendation on uh, funding mechanisms for all these improvements, whether it be funding mechanism for improvements to Davidson County, our surrounding counties, and RTA, or are you just going to put together a plan and say, well, somebody's got a wish list? Um, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, in cities that have successfully dealt with it, you really go in several phases. It's first, and the phase we're in is recognizing we have a real issue we're going to have to deal with one way or the other. Whether you deal with it with a transit system or you deal with it with a highway network or you deal with it in any variety of means, people are understanding with the growth of the region that it's tougher to get around. It's only going to get tougher after that. From my perspective, going in with a communi community-based solutions, here's what we will and won't accept, here's what we do and don't need, and again, get the little things right. And then in that whole think big, you know, again, of long term, of how many more people are here, if you come up with a system design that people genuinely say, that, that the general public can genuinely say, yeah, th this makes sense to me, and it is expensive, and, and 
I'll tell you up front, it is expensive. The cities that, frankly, love their light rail systems or love that type of thing have spent billions of dollars to get where they are, and they're spending billions more. Part of the issue with that is, number one, what does it cost us if we don't do it? You know, what does it cost you um, as an individual sitting in traffic for more and more time each day? What does it cost you as a business if you can't get people you know, in on those shifts late at night or what have you? What does it cost us as a community if people all over the city aren't connected to the economic activity? Um, that's one piece. And number two is, remember, if the projections are right, there's a million more people to help pay for it. And what you've seen around the country is when people are given that choice and there's a credible plan that people can kind of, yeah, that's something I want, there's a fair way to pay for it. You know, and there's credibility in the people who are, who are quote, promising the plan, then overwhelmingly, even, even in relatively conservative places, people are saying, yeah, I'm willing to pay some more for mobility. And when you break it down, the type of magnitude of spending we're talking about probably comes down to giving, giving up a cup of that premium coffee once a week or something like that. You know, it's not, if it's $4 billion, it's not all coming out of your pocket. Hopefully it's spread out, you know, among a whole bunch of us and that the region sees an economic return in doing that. Hope that helps. Uh, yes, sir. I want, it's, I want to say he kind of helped me segue into something that I, that I thought about is that we're talking about a 10 county area eventually, you know. That means you're talking about legislative districts and yes, congressional districts. But I'll just say it publicly, part of the reason the AMP failed is one individual in this town, well placed, went to the state legislature and basically got a law passed that, you know, made the original plan for the AMP just kind of you know, so we need this government involvement at the state level, but we need it in a positive input manner mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, hindering the process. Right. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up, and w without a doubt, because another point I'd make is transit system alone is not going to solve what the MTA can do, what the RTA can do alone is not going to solve mobility issues in this region. It's going to be a mix of things. People talk about New York City as being sort of the epicenter of public transit in North America, and everybody uses transit in New York City, and it's absolutely true. Uh, but in New York City, 48% of the people who live in New York City also own a car. So it all has to coexist. It all has to work together. That includes things like um, ride share, car share, and that includes us partnering with organizations like TDOT. You know, MTA isn't the only one who has these issues. TDOT's got to figure out how are we going to move more people around our region. You know, and I'm, based on our conversations early on, they do recognize that a vibrant public transit system, particularly in areas like Nashville, you know, is going to be an important part of that equation. And making sure that balance fits properly, I think, is going to be an important part of our discussion uh, moving forward. I think, are you giving me the hook, Larry? Steve, let's, <laughs> let's take about three more questions. Okay. And if we don't get to get to everyone, I want to ask that you fill out the information card and we'll get back with okay. you. Where Appreciate did all that leftover AMP money go? Uh, Metro Council took it back for other city needs. So, Maybe yes, sir. Maybe they used it for the rest of this planning. What are the of a partnership with CSX or other railroads? Wow, that's, see, now that's another question. Right after, right after where's my app, I get that one. Um, we certainly as part of the, particularly the RTA plan, that conversation, whether it's CSX or it's the short lines, needs to happen. I think we all, though, also have to recognize that part of the economic vibrancy of the region also depends on freight moving around. So, you know, I, I think we oversimplify and we say, well, just let our commuter trains on your rail lines you know, and everything will work fine. Um, what, what I would hope is we're able to bring them to the table, and this is another area where the gentleman's question about making sure the state is engaged, to say, okay, what are the issues? You know, how do we make the overall network work better? And can that be a part of the solution, recognizing that, boy, if we're moving commuters efficiently through Nashville, but we can't get freight from the port of New Orleans to New England, um, we haven't maybe accomplished much. So. It's going to have to be part of the discussion. I will say from experience, class one railroads are tough. Um, they're huge uh, and they move a lot of freight, but absolutely something we're going to have to uh, take a look at. 
Come back to the other. Anybody on this side? Who got that side exhausted? Yes, sir. Sir, you, you, have, you have thought of everybody to. Well, I'm sorry. Can I get this first, first of all? Starting in Bell Mead, why not start in East Nashville where you need to be, in North Nashville, 8th Avenue, you know. Well, the intent is to be. Yep. Them the people that need right. it. These folks don't need it. They got automobiles. They got everything else. Well, the intent is to build a system that, that everybody can use. Like you always do. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll look, for, we'll look forward to your comments. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. My main issue about the bus is sometimes, and this happens usually in the early mornings, you have your rookie drivers who obviously don't know the route very well, and that's kind of inconvenient. Right. Now, I appreciate it, and reliability came up as a huge issue, and one, uh, absolutely. You know, when we talk about big steps and small steps, what you're talking about are some of the small steps that are absolutely doable. So appreciate that observation. Can I take one more question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think the bus drivers absolutely rock. Uh, I'll differ with the previous speaker. We've all got our own opinions. Uh, the retention rate, I understand, is way too high. I think that needs to be addressed. I'm not going to micromanage that. Uh, that's, that's what you all do, and you do it very well. Uh, one thought, though, uh, it's a stressful job driving this mm -hmm. town. Uh, Make the understatement of the millennium. Uh, <laughs> yoga classes might be something you might put on the front burner. I'll be quiet. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad uh, someone gave a shout out to the drivers. I was in our, our budget hearing with the mayor the other day, and I referred to because I hear it all over town when I talk to riders. They say, I've ridden transit systems all over the country, and you have the friendliest drivers in the country. And my experience, having ridden a bunch of other systems, is I would absolutely agree with that statement. Well, very good. I appreciate it. Larry's giving me the hook. Um, please stay in the dialogue. Please let us know what you think, and please let us know who else we should be talking to. I'm a handicap person. I want to say something. We need to get our heads together where we get to our convenience stores and malls and stuff, and get convenience from downtown and back on another system. We need to get the rural people on the buses so they can ride where they need to go and get them up and down in downtown on another system. We need to get our neighborhoods, our shops, our little neighborhoods, talk to us, get to our friends, get to our neighbors, so we can communicate. If we get our people riding it like we should, we can get around. And handicapped people need to be helped more than what they are now. They're getting hurt riding these buses and need to stop. I think that you have summed it up really perfectly. We have a number of MTA staff and support folks around the room. So for folks who want to continue the dialogue, we're happy to hang around for a while, but everyone, we really appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us today, and please stay engaged.